Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. My name is Isabella Baker, and I'm a policy fellow with the U.S. Commission on Security and Cooperation in Europe, also known as the U.S. Helsinki Commission. Today's briefing will be on the subject of Moldova's European future. Our conversation will analyze the results of Moldova's recent presidential elections and an EU referendum, their impact on Moldova's pursuit of a European future, and explore policy recommendations to further consolidate Moldovan's democracy, particularly against some further malign Russian interference. On October 20th of this year, a constitutional referendum enshrining EU accession as a national objective passed by a majority vote. Two weeks later, the Moldovan people re-elected incumbent President Maya Sandu in his second round runoff. These developments, bolstered by historic turnout, represent a steadfast commitment to democracy and a renewed mandate to building a stronger, more secure European future for Moldova. Putin's imperialist Eastern European strategy hedges against unity. Moldovan's pursuit of unity and advancement of its EU path fractures the Kremlin strategy while strengthening domestic institutions and civil society resilience. Within just the last 30 days, Moldova has signed a memorandum of understanding with Nordic and Baltic states to enhance democratic and economic consideration. Moldovan representatives welcomed for the first time the EU Political and Security Committee to Chisinau, and President Sandu engaged in dialogue with key heads of state at the European Political Community Summit to advance reform efforts. Moldova's path to EU accession nevertheless continues to be undermined by both hybrid and kinetic Russian interference. Regional unity against these threats is paramount, therefore, particularly in light of Russia's genocidal invasion of Ukraine, Moldova's eastern neighbor. Western coalition allies must collaborate to address these vulnerabilities and support Moldova's capacity for sovereign self-determination. To help us explore these issues, we will hear from three expert panelists. After brief introductions, they will have the time to deliver remarks, and then we will open the floor to a Q&A exchange. Speaking first, and on the results of the historic significance of Moldova's presidential election and referendum, is Mr. Stephen Nix. Mr. Nix is a senior director for Eurasia at the International Republican Institute, where he has worked since 2000. In his current role, he oversees programs in Belarus, Georgia, the Kyrgyz Republic, Moldova, Russia, and Ukraine. Nix resided in Kiev, Ukraine for more than three years and assisted in drafting of crucial reform legislation, including the Constitution, the Presidential and Parliamentary Election Laws, and the Law in the Constitutional Court of Ukraine. He received his Juris Doctorate from the Georgetown University Law Center in 1989. Our next panelist discussing hybrid Russian interference is Dr. Donald Jensen. Dr. Jensen is a senior advisor for Russia and Europe at the United States Institute for Peace. He writes extensively on Russian domestic pol politics and Russian foreign and security policies, specializing in hybrid warfare and the policies of other post-Soviet states, especially Ukraine and Moldova. A former U.S. diplomat, Dr. Jensen provided staff support for the START, INF, and SDI treaty negotiations. From 1996 to 2008, Dr. Jensen was Associate Director of Broadcasting and Head of the Research Division at Free Radio Free Europe. Dr. Jensen received his BA from Columbia University and his MA and PhD from Harvard University. Our third and final panelist, Dr. Stephen Blank, will be discussing what obstacles might inhibit Moldova's EU accession and the significance of these elections and referendum in that EU context. Dr. Blank is a senior fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute and an internationally recognized expert on Russian foreign and defense policies, as well as international relations across the former Soviet Union. He has consulted for the CIA, major think tanks and foundations, and chaired major international conferences in the UA and USA and abroad. He has published over 1,300 articles and monographs on Soviet, Russian, US, Asian, and European military and foreign policies. Dr. Blank received his MA and PhD in Russian history from the University of Chicago and his BA in history from the University of Pennsylvania. After hearing from our three panelists, I will open the Q&A and take a couple of questions from the floor. We invite our audience to think about questions throughout this event and to take advantage of the fact that you are sharing a room with three eminent experts in this space. After the Q&A, we will revert to the panel for closing remarks. Given the very optimistic turnout today, which I'm delighted to see, I anticipate a frank and insightful session. With that, I pass the floor to Mr. Stephen Nix for his remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me today. 
Uh, my plan today is to provide you with some facts uh, of the presidential elections, both rounds, as well as the EU referendum, then provide some analysis thereof, and then take a look towards the future to parliamentary elections, which we assess are likely to take place in the autumn of 2025 and will be critical for Moldova's continuing democratic development and its accession to the EU. Uh, the presidential election, as our, our first speaker said, uh, took place as the fifth presidential election since Moldova's independence. And it came as a, at a critical and decisive moment for Moldova with regard to their country's path towards Europe. 11 candidates ran for the presidency. Since no candidate received 50% plus one of the vote, the election resulted in runoff between two candidates um, from Moldova's two largest political parties. That would be Maya Sandu, who represents PAS, Party of Action and Solidarity, and Alexander Stoyanoglu, representing the Party of Socialists, a very pro-Russian party, pro-Russian candidate. IRI's International Election Observation Mission, we had two, one for each round, uh, drew a number of conclusions. First of all, that both elections were well administered, demonstrating resilience in the face of gross Russian interference. Before election day, Moldovan law enforcement authorities and the Audiovisual Council took steps to counter illicit finance and malign information operations, uncovering allegations of a massive vote buying network linked to the Russian Federation and banning approximately 100 telegram channels and accounts belonging to the fugitive oligarch Igan Shor and his affiliates. The Central Election Commission successfully increased polling stations abroad, implemented postal voting, and maintained polling stations in Transnistria, uh, despite security concerns. Strong participation from citizens and international observers also ensured a high level of transparency at polling stations. So Moldova has made impressive strides to align its legal frameworks to international conventions for democratic elections. Yet, despite this progress, Moldova's institutions are under constant assault from malign actors who are intent on destabilizing the country, usurping the will of the Moldovan people. Undeniably, the greatest threat to Moldova's electoral integrity is malign foreign influence directed from the Kremlin. The 2024 electoral period saw unprecedented levels of brazen Russian interference throughout the election cycle. Principally, the tentacles of foreign influence included a vote buying network that allegedly paid up to 130,000 Moldovan citizens to act in line with the fugitive oligarch Ian Shore and his criminal network. They also were involved in the training of provocateurs on methods of destabilization, information manipulation, alleged cyber attacks on the Central Election Commission, and other illegal activities. On election day, this interference manifested in carousel voting schemes and influence agents in proximity of polling stations. The second round, the runoff, saw escalated attempts at outside interference, which included AI-generated robocall death threats, an increased number of bomb threats at international polling locations, and attempted arson at the Central Election Commission of Moldova. Collectively, these pernicious acts attempted to undermine the fairness of the election and to erode confidence in the process. Consequently, Moldovans and the democratic community must remain vigilant during future elections. The constitutional referendum was approved by voters, well surpassing the 33% turnout requirement. The referendum was confirmed by the constitutional court, thus enshrining Moldova's desire for a European future into its constitution. The diaspora turnout in the first round was essential for pushing the constitutional referendum over the required 50% level of support. Moldovan diaspora, the majority of whom currently reside in the European Union, represented almost 18% of the turnout and voted in support of Moldova's accession to the European Union at a rate of almost 77%. The presidential runoff election resulted in incumbent Maya Sandu winning election by over 55% of the popular vote. President Sandu's clear mandate was supported by the highest recorded turnout of diaspora voters. During the runoff, 328,000 Moldovan diaspora turned out to vote, 
representing almost 20% of overall turnout. And the diaspora voted for Maya Sandu at nearly 83%, thus securing her reelection. In sum, the Moldovan government must continue to undertake efforts to resist foreign authoritarian influence and its electoral processes as it prepares for critical parliamentary elections in 2025. The escalation of Russian interference tactics during the presidential election demonstrates the piloting of new Russian techniques, which are expected to further escalate during the upcoming parliamentary elections. These elections will be critical for forming a new government during President Maya Sandu's second term. The US government must support Moldova as a strategic partner and ally in order to offset Russia in the parliamentary elections. Such support will be paramount and should continue European trajectory for Moldova. The US government must also work to counter foreign malign influence so that non-governmental and state institutions are better equipped to confront the many threats that foreign authoritarians pose to Moldova's democracy. The US government must also be prepared for the probability that these same techniques will be used not only in Moldova, but in other countries in Eastern Europe in the region. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Nix. Dr. Jensen, I pass the floor to you. I even turned the microphone on properly. <laughs> Uh, thank you for having me. It's a privilege to speak here. I haven't seen my Steve friends in quite a while, and it's good to see them again. I want to uh, talk about Russia's malign influence, and it's never clear whether to call it disinformation or malign influence or gray zone activities, but let's talk about that stuff, which is so critical to Russian foreign policy and played a critical role, as Steve, this Steve said, in the election season so far. But I also want to talk a little bit about how this kind of activity, this hybrid warfare, if we can use the H word, uh, fits into Russian foreign policy more generally and why we should care and how the U.S. and its allies might begin to combat and push back on it. As Steve said, the re recent voting results, both for the referendum and the presidential elections, keep Russia, on, excuse me, keep Moldova on a Western path. But its democracy is fragile. The people are divided economically, ethnically, linguistically, and uh, in many other ways. Russia's actions are a, not an anomaly, but a pattern, an integral part of their foreign policy, an instrument, it's a weapon that they use. Uh, <clears throat> they use it not only in Moldova, but in Georgia and Ukraine and, and many other, uh, I hate to use the word post-Soviet countries, but I'll say in the countries along their periphery. They use it as well in Italy, Spain, and elsewhere as well. And it's important to keep in mind that this is a strategy by Moscow. This is not, it's based on opportunity, it's based on tactical flexibility, and so forth. Russia does this for a reason, sometimes successfully, not always, sometimes contradictorily, but Russia wants to cause chaos for strategic effect. And that itself is good enough, even if it sometimes appears very contradictory. <clears throat> As Steve said, Russia's influence in both channels of electoral activity in the past month and a half has been substantial. Cyber attacks, espionage, reported training of thugs in Bosnia, training, Republic Srpska training camps, and so forth. I have a pile of stuff in my office going down in detail all of what was involved. FSB involvement, GRU involvement, the creation of money transfers electronically, and so forth. That would take a separate briefing. But for all the attention that sure, the alleged, the oligarch sure gets, there are many other mal, bad players in the situation as well. And we have to not focus so much just on those two or the governor of Gagauzia, but see this as a Russian strategy that it uses in many, many countries. And start to realize that in Moldova, Russia is at war with Moldova, period. It's just that its weapons are not drones and missiles and armored vehicles. Its weapons are money, uh, coercion, corruption, uh, uh, disinformation, and other things. And for Moscow, this is all part of the same bag of tricks. 
and we have to be more sensitive, I think, here in the West to the way that they do this. It's uh, backed in a way by sort of an implicit threat of military action. But one could argue that Moldova today, after three years of very intense Russian hybrid activity, is at least as much in danger as it would have been had there been more Russian military uh, soldiers parked, parked along its borders or in an enhanced presence in Transnistria. But, <coughs> excuse me, we have to also keep in mind that Russia, excuse me, that Moldova is a vulnerable society. Its fragility is relatively weak compared to some of the other countries along the Russian periphery. And that's why it's so very important for the United States to, and the West to help them resist, help them develop the, this, the resilience that is so essential for it to, to go along its Western path. It's absolutely critical. Uh, one of the, my colleagues in the audience asked before we sat down about the differences between the two countries. Well, that's a separate briefing, but Moldova has unique fe features that I would argue make it more vulnerable than some of the other countries we've talked about. Uh, number one would be the ethnic, religious, uh, economic divisions within the country. Number two would be the very alarming <coughs> electoral outcome where the diaspora really put them over the top. And if you go back and look at the polls, you'll see that just a few days before the election, all the polls had Sandu and her party doing much better in a referendum than people had predicted. Why? Because the Russians handed out m money, I almost said buck, handed out rubles, ostensibly lobbied propaganda and these other weapons I've talked about at the independent voting in particular, and that had an effect. And one of the interesting points about this election is that for all the countries I've looked at and the, the role of Russian hybrid warfare, this is one example where you can almost clearly measure the effect of this kind of activity. In a lot of countries, you can't. I think about a Wall Street Journal editorial two weeks ago, which talked about th this and Georgia are two countries where Russian influence is obvious, it's palpable, and it's almost measurable. And there should be a lesson for those of us who want to push back about, against Russia's malign influence and also strengthen the resilience of Moldova and its neighbors. Now, again, this is not the late last and only attempt by Russia to destabilize the country. They have started two or three years ago using energy as a weapon, bribing politicians, propaganda, all sorts of things. And if you uh, track the narratives on uh, Russian financed media about uh, what's going on in the country, it's not only an invented fiction, but it's also uh, very tactical, very able to adjust to various circumstances on the ground. And as I said earlier, that is one of the keys to the Russian approach. They don't need a strategy as we understand it in various think tanks in the West. They're very opportunistic. They, can, they study weaknesses as they study vulnerabilities and so forth. Now, <clears throat> two points in, uh, as I wind up. One is Gagauzia, where it was 93%, I think, for yes. the pro-Russian candidate. Gagauzia is a very, very interesting place. The uh, losing presidential candidate, Stoyanoglu, is that how you pronounce it? Yes. Stoyanoglu Stoyan. is ethnically Gagauz, and Russia plays that card very, very aggressively. It's tensions with the center, ethnically different from the majority of Moldovans, a vulnerable place that Russia, as we've seen in so many other places, can take advantage of, can exploit almost before our eyes. In Transnistria, which is probably something the other Steve is going to talk about, uh, things are a little bit better. The vote there went, I think, 70% for the Russian candidate. Uh, uh, the fact that the Ukrainians have closed the borders has meant that they've had to turn to Romania and the European Union for some of their economic activity. And that seems, although it's not proven, that seems to have stabilized the situation have it going in the right, right direction. But as we've seen elsewhere, you don't go in the right direction without support from your partners, support from the West, and uh, a very serious campaign to push back against Russian malign influence. That, I think, should be our goal, because as Steve said, the parliamentary elections are coming by July. The parliamentary elections will elect a legislature which will be instrumental in the activities preparing Moldova for eventual U European Union accession. So if a Russian party 
goes into a coalition with PAS, although Sandu's party, or Russia exerts its other kind of malign influence elsewhere, the EU accession process can be stopped and hindered and spread out and ultimately go off the rails as we've seen in some other post-Soviet countries nearby. So what can we do? First of all, we need to do the kind of work we do at USIP, frankly, about improving institutions, battling corruptions, strengthening the rule of law. And these are not big ticket items. These are something you can do uh, with good planning, good engagement with Russian, with, excuse, I did it again, a third time, with Moldovan civil society. That's number one. Number two, we need to strengthen Moldova's energy independence from Russia. Uh, the, the natural gas now comes from Russia via Ukraine into Transnistria and then westward. Again, this is a very vulnerable choke point for Russian influence. And we've seen that happen most notably in Ukraine 10 or 15 years ago, but elsewhere as well. Uh, third, I think we need to call upon and work with the Moldovan government to be a little more proactive in dealing with the Transnistria and Gagauz issues where they're both separatist forces, as I've seen. But I think some of those people have grievances that maybe can be better addressed more effectively by a focus in building resilience with, of course, Western support as well. And uh, fourth, I would add that, that the issue of combating disinformation is a tough one. And uh, uh, you know it when you see it, and certainly know it and saw it in the elections in the past few weeks. But I think uh, a more systematic attempt, as we're trying at USIP at least, to help Moldovans identify disinformation, help them know when to pull out when to pull out a piece of paper as garbage, a news report, and when to know something is valid and legitimate. That takes a sophisticated eye, it takes training, it takes patience on our side, and it takes cooperation between Moldova and its allies. So a lot of challenges have ahead, they can be accomplished, certainly the outcome of the elections, whether the diaspora put them over the top or not, is, is another step in the right direction. But as we've seen elsewhere in recent months, uh, nothing is inevitable in this part of the world, countries go off the rails or go backwards or sideways, and we all, uh, I think we all can work together more effectively to make sure that Moldova goes forward. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jensen. Dr. Blank, I give the floor to you. Thank you, Isabella. It's a great honor to speak to this audience on Moldova. As my colleagues have said, there's not much, so much so ably, there's not much for me left to say, but I'll do it anyway. Um, Moldova is a front in Russia's war against the West. The Balkans as a whole are a theater, one theater, but the West as a whole is a target. So just to give you an example, the bomb scares last week at election polls here in the United States, those are Russian. We now know that Russia, on at least two occasions, has tried to uh, place incendiary packages on civilian aircraft flying from Europe to the United States that would blow up in midair, killing hundreds of people. We know that the Russians are waging massive disinformation campaigns on American media. The case in Tennessee, which you may have read about in the papers, where the FBI busted uh, one of these, is an example. There is plenty of others that we found uh, before the election. Now, in Moldova, the Russians are investing a great deal of time, energy, and resources, despite the fact that a lot of experts tend to say that the Balkans is not that serious a theater uh, for Moscow. Uh, I think if you've studied Russian history, you'll realize very quickly that's nonsense. It's a critical theater for Russia by which it hopes to expand its influence and standing as a great power and thwart European integration, which is a fundamental strategic objective of the Putin administration and has been for at least 15 to 20 years. Now, the election returns are not returns that allow us to be complacent. Sandu would not have won, and the European Union accession referendum would not have been won without diaspora votes. That means there is substantial domestic discontent. And that discontent is one of the elements that Russia intends to exploit. They refuse to recognize the outcome of Sandu's election. They will not accept the referendum vote either. And so therefore, they are going to keep trying using the instruments that Don has talked about and that Steve has talked about and that I will talk about also. 
And they will continue to do so because Moldovan society is vulnerable in several ways. And what you have to understand about the Russian war is Russia does not create these vulnerabilities. It exploits them. It aggravates them. So just as it tried to exploit and aggravate the polarity, polarization we see in the United States, which all of you are aware of, it seeks to do the same in Moldova. And there are numerous vulnerabilities there. First of all, the military one. Russian forces in Transnistria are a constant threat to the security of Moldova. Because there's a constant threat of invasion, and particularly if Ukraine falls. As a matter of fact, in 2014, the Russians tried to use the forces in Tiraspol, the capital of Transnistria, to move to Odessa after setting off riots there in order, quote, to stabilize the situation. So they would have created an entire belt, of what Putin then called Novorossiya, New Russia, uh, all the way to Moldova, and deprive Ukraine of access to the Black Sea and create a, a new order, basically, in the Black Sea and the Balkans. So the military pressure is constant. The other day, there were Russian drones overflew Moldova. So this is not something that is quiescent. It's happening. Second, Don mentioned this, energy. Russia ostensibly sells cheap energy to its customers, and then once they're hooked, like a pusher with heroin, raises the price. That's, that's an exact analogy, by the way. It's not something uh, fanciful. And it establishes energy dependence plus getting lots and lots of money for itself and for its proxies in these countries, like Elon Shore or the others that have been mentioned here. And when the government, in this case Sandu's government, tries to reduce dependence on Russian energy, that creates hardship in the country because of the fact that the Balkans are an energy importing area. And that hardship then becomes an excuse that's, uh, for voting Russian and for another vulnerability for the Russians to exploit. Because in Moldova, as here, it's the economy, stupid. I mean, people vote their economic situation. A third source of pressure is Russian access to control over the media. It's not just disinformation. Russian forces actually own media in Moldova, in Bulgaria, in Great Britain. And if they could, they would do so here. The Tennessee case is an example of their trying to uh, buy influence on uh, American media. Uh, in this case, I believe, uh, internet-based uh, uh, media, not newspapers and TV stations, but nonetheless critical. So it's a general tactic. This is a problem throughout the Balkans as well, as I suggested. Uh, if you look at Serbia, it's, and I've written and published about that in Serbia. So it's an attempt by Russia to continuously leverage and pressure its media presence as well as its ability to influence elites and public and to corrupt and blackmail elites into serving it. And it is extremely difficult to curtail, one of the reasons being because the US government for the last 30 years has had no systematic information policy to, uh, to counter Russia, either in terms of Russian domestic media at home or what the Russians are doing abroad. Uh, admittedly, as Don said, it's very difficult, but it needs to be done. And hopefully the Trump administration will address this problem because it is a weapon that Russia uses globally, not just Moldova. It's being used here. It's in Africa. It's in Latin America. It's all over Europe. And if you follow Russian foreign policy, you can see that. And it creates major difficulties for the U.S. To give you a quick vignette, 10 years ago I, I was speaking to Southcom and a colonel raised his hand and said, what can we do about the fact that the first television channel in Argentina is controlled by the Russians? And I had to say to him, nothing. You can't do anything about it. The US military can't intervene in foreign media. Uh, the US government has to have a counter. And it didn't, and it doesn't. So in Moldova, what we're dealing with is just a representat representative sample of what you're seeing elsewhere. Fourth, Don mentioned the ethnic cleavage. The Gagauz are a Christianized Turkic people. That is, they are Turkic in ethnic origin, but they became Christians. So, for example, Stoyan Oglu's name, Oglu is a Turkish last name, meaning son of. Like Johnson, son of John in English, Stoyan Oglu is son of Stoyan, which is a Balkan name. And they feel themselves to be discriminated against. They feel aggrieved. This creates an enormous opportunity for the Russians. As Don said, they got 93% of the vote in the last election. And Furthermore, they 
were attracted to Russia. And since the Russian government defines as Russians, and this is the Soviet definition, and actually it's a czarist definition, Russian speakers are Russians. So, for example, in my hometown, uh, we have, th which is Brooklyn, New York, we have thousands of Russian speakers who are supposedly eagerly awaiting the second coming of Vladimir Putin. Uh, 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 by this definition, I and my mother's family would have also been Russians because uh, my mother's parents grew up in Tsarist Russia and spoke Russian. So as a result, Russian speakers are a pretext for Russia to intervene abroad. This is a line of reasoning that goes back to the Tsars. It was used by Catherine the Great in the partitions of Poland. It was used by Hitler, by the way, for his incorporation of uh, Eastern European states into the Reich. It's also used by Stalin in 1939 uh, to liberate, quote, Poland uh, and Belarus and Ukraine from uh, the oppressive Polish government that was oppressing Russian speakers and, Pol and, and peasants. Uh, it's a pretext, but it is an effective weapon of destabilization throughout Eastern Europe. So it's, again, it's not Moldova alone. Just as we have major ethnic issues in the Balkans as a whole, we have major ethnic issues in Moldova that lend themselves to exploitation by Russia. Fifth, corruption. Now, there's corruption in every major political system. Having gone to school in Chicago, I remember back in the old days that Chicago was a very corrupt city. Uh, if we had time, I would give you a vignette of that. But the fact of the matter is that in Moldova, corruption and throughout the former Soviet Union, corruption is a way of life. One of my Ukrainian refugee friends said to me that Ukrainians have lived by corruption for 500 years. It's not going to stop. Well, it's not going to stop if we don't address ourselves to making it stop and creating conditions for improved governance, democratic transparency, and so forth that are all essential to bringing Moldova into the EU. And that is the work that has to be done both by the Moldovan government and by foreign institutions like IRI, its Democratic Party equivalent, the EU, and so on. So that's a fifth vulnerability because if, if corruption is rampant and you own access to media and, inf and energy, uh, you can either blackmail or simply bribe politicians to do as you like. We see this in Bulgaria, we see this in Serbia, and we see it in Moldova. So again, it's ubiquitous. Domestic reform, therefore, is a difficult problem for Moldova. If the election had been confined to merely those residents of Moldova who live in the, city, in the state, Sander would have lost and the EU referendum would have probably lost also. And therefore, we and the European Union need to constantly be on the case to help the Moldovans improve governance, improve economic conditions, reduce ethnic tensions, reduce exposure and vulnerability to Russian energy and to Russian media. And I would argue that the most important thing we could do to take out the pressure or take off the pressure from Russia is to win the war in Ukraine because that will decisively force Moscow out of the Balkans to a very large degree. It will deprive them of a lot of the money and capability they have given the fact that this would also require a reorienting European oil and gas supplies, which we have not done enough of. So these five areas are, uh, six areas, excuse me, are all areas where reform is needed. They are needed by the domestic authorities and by foreign authorities like European Union and the, the two parties that have in the United States, their democratic, uh, democracy-based organizations uh, helping Moldova and for that matter, other Balkan countries improve their governance, transparency, and thus their security. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Blank. So now we have heard from all three of our panelists, and I will use my privileged position as moderator to begin our Q&A. So we've heard a lot of discussion today about all the ethnic cleavages in the autonomous region of the South Gagausia, as well as along the eastern Borgian border, uh, Transnistria. So considering these cleavages, the different languages, religions, backgrounds, how can we consider a path forward to EU enlargement while still balancing a coalition at home? We can begin with Mr. Nix, and then move down. Sure, there are a lot of things, a number of things that the government of Moldova can do to address the, the cleavages that we've discussed today uh, with Gagouz and, and uh, 
uh, and people up north in the belts. Uh, I think the government between now and the parliamentary elections has to make a concerted effort to really do listening tours. Clearly the Gagus feel aggrieved. Uh, I think they really need government to listen to these grievances. So I think you're gonna see the Sandu government uh, travel more to Gagus. They've got to go there, they've got to speak Russian. Uh, and be sympathetic to the issues that the Gagus have. And quite frankly, this, the same strategy should be employed in the North, where uh, the Sandu campaign had very, very poor results. So again, it's a matter of reaching out. It's a matter of speaking Russian language. Uh, at IRI, we've done some youth events because we, we did some polling and saw that youth were positive towards EU accession in Gagayu. So we did some youth events involving President Sandu and the Prime Minister. Uh, they need to do more things like that, and we're in a position to help the government do that, to try to increase the connectivity between Chisinau and the North and the South. Dr. Jensen. Yeah, I agree with Steve. Uh, the issue of corruption is really a tough one to crack. And, uh, we, I, I hate to have another commercial for where I work, but USIP has done a lot of good work in Ukraine about this. Strengthening the rule of law, strengthening the judiciary, making people understand the rights and responsibilities of citizens. It's not a high ticket item, but it's very important. And uh, the NGO community in Ukraine, led by women in many cases, I think needs something that needs a great deal of support. You guys do great work there. But I think in general, uh, uh, in cooperation with the Moldovan government, that Western partners can do a lot just by working with uh, the society in a way that makes it less top-down, makes the government, as you said, less passive, and reaches out and dealing with some of these problems uh, in advance. I used the word fragility earlier, and I mean that for fragile. This is, uh, in many ways, a dangerous situation. and. Uh, uh, I was very troubled by the fact that in the last few days, as I said, so many votes seem to go against Sandu and the referendum. And I think that's a warning that we ought to do more and with, with our Moldovan partners. I think it can be done, but again, we're in a very critical window now between now and the parliamentary elections. And whatever happens, as Steve, this Steve said, in Ukraine, uh, <clears throat> according to the, some of you know, the Dossier Center website, which is put out by the Kodakorsky people, and they had a very interesting article about two weeks ago that the plan was, and we, you and I have heard this many times, that militarily Russia would invade Ukraine, uh, invade uh, Moldova until the war started to go badly. Then they switched to the more non-kinetic ways of exerting pressure. And then I said earlier, at the beginning of my remarks, these are part of the same thing. It's not war or peace. Russia can, knows that it can get away with a lot of stuff under the radar, that the US might be engaged elsewhere, that Britain, France, Italy, and Germany might also be well uh, engaged and not willing to put the kind of effort into these kinds of reforms that we need to put, they, we need to have, but we have to do it anyway, because in the long run, this is not about Moldova, Ukraine, or Georgia. It's about Putin's war on the West, and these are merely the most vulnerable, easily dis dislodgeable bricks in a broader campaign to upset the world order. I think we cannot separate the one and one locale from the other because Putin and Patrushev and Narushkin and all these people in Moscow talk about it every day. And I think we ought to take, take them seriously. Dr. Blank. Well, uh, building on what my colleagues have said here, I would argue also for this, since the, we have an administration that is coming in, uh, they can build on what the Biden administration has done to expand energy production. It's not commonly known that the Biden administration has uh, fostered policies that make the United States the largest oil and gas exporter in the world right now. But we need to help get energy to European countries that were hitherto de uh, dependent on Russian energy. One way is to tighten up the sanctions regime to deprive Moscow of the revenue it gets that can fund its war effort and its foreign efforts abroad as well. And second, by doing so, and uh, to use President-elect Trump's phrase, uh, drill baby drill means nothing unless you have a market to sell all that stuff. Uh, 
you know, the, the companies are not going to drill if they can't sell it. If you could sell it to the Balkans, that's a, you know, it's not the hugest market in the world by any means, but it's also a way of building pipelines into the Balkans, interconnectors through Eastern Europe, and we're leaving uh, all of these states' dependence on Moscow and thwarting Moscow's ability to wage war while also undermining a major instrument of corruption and also uh, the, the revenues by which Moscow can fund its media operations in Moldova. And of course, my colleagues' recommendations are ones that I support as well. All right. We have heard from all of our panelists a very clear summary of all of the multi-layer issues in Moldova about its process to EU accession and the obstacles in its way. I will now open the floor to questions from our audience. You are all very welcome to join us at the podium here. Please state your name and affiliation. So if you have a question, we invite you to line up here, and we'd love to hear from you. Thank you. Whoever would like to go first, you're very welcome. If you please state your name and affiliation before beginning your question. And uh, I'm, I, I'm running for House of Representatives. Uh, I relocated December 4th. Uh, my first question is, uh, hydroelectricity was a leading electrical uh, generator uh, prior to nuclear. Um, and I'm just wondering, with ocean water desalination, as it will be a good uh, hydroelectric uh, con conductor, uh, instead of focusing on coal-powered nuclear energy, wouldn't building hydroelectric desalination plants uh, every 100 miles uh, be a better, uh, a greater investment? This is a very clear and interesting question. I wonder if we can tie it to the region, if you have a specific question about the Black Sea region or Eastern Europe. Uh, certainly, um, but it, it, won't be, it won't be tied, uh, but uh, uh, I, have, I have a different question, uh, but it, it, it's, not, it's not about uh, electrical policy. As long as it's about Moldova's European future or the broader region, we would welcome it. Countryside with the new, nearest superpower. Within other civilization policies and politics, uh, shouldn't we be, be concerned of mistrust and hatred for generations to come? Uh, because to define uh, imagine in Russia is, uh, is the definition of some place you've never experienced and some place that's it's institutionalized. Since it, it's a completely different civilization, they have a completely different walk of life. Thank you for your question. I'll address it to our moderator. So I believe the question is, Thank you, Dr. Blank, to distress uh, youth and hate and how to combat that. Well, uh, to, the best way to uh, combat hatred is by democratic education, with a capital D. I'm not talking about democratic party. I'm talking about democracy broad, more, more broadly. We've, one of the founding principles on which this country is built is that the more you educate people, that the, a well-educated citizenry is essential for democracy, and a well-educated citizenry is one that is impervious to appeals to hatred. So uh, more democracy in Europe and uh, for that matter elsewhere is in general a good thing to the extent that we can do it. Uh, I would take issue with your original point that uh, countries next to each other necessarily are subordinate to them uh, I assure you that the Baltic states and Poland do not intend to become subordinate to Russia, even though it's their neighbor. Uh, I could speak from personal experience on this, uh, but uh, you've talked to uh, experts on these countries, and they will tell you first rate that they identify completely with the West and the progress they've made since 1991, which is quite astonishing uh, in many respects, indicates the superiority of democracy over their neighbors autocratic imperialism. Thank you, Dr. Blank. While I would be happy to address this question to our other two panelists, it looks as if we have many questions to address. So with your consent, I'll move forward. All right. Please state your name and affiliation. Hi, this is Mark Sawyer. I'm with the Center for Information Resilience. Um, as Mr. Nix mentioned, we're just under a year um, from parliamentary elections, and you know, all of us in this room represent quite a few offices, NGOs, private companies. Are there concrete things that um, the United States or those of us in the audience can do in the next nine months in this more short-term window to um, degrade Russia's capabilities for um, hybrid warfare and, and hard in Moldova for the next election cycle. Thank you. Sure, thank you for the question. Let's first talk about how the Moldovan government addressed this issue and then we can talk 
uh, more general about what uh, its partners, Moldova's partners, can do to help them. Uh, the government woke up after the first round. Once this huge, massive, um, <laughs> unprecedented vote buying scheme was was unveiled, uh, they did take appropriate steps. Uh, they uh, basically went to the three major cell phone carriers and sent text messages to everyone with a cell phone in the country saying the following. Vote buying and vote selling is a felony. It's punishable by a two-year prison term and a fine of 2,000 euros. They also broadcast that on public transportation. Uh, in fact, I was in a, a grocery store and I heard it on the PA system. So they took steps to educate the public this is against the law. If you do this in the second round, you will be prosecuted. So they did take steps, and we feel, in, in our observation of the second round, that uh, the methods used were less effective. Those who were willing to sell their votes in the first round were reluctant to do it in the second because of these warnings from the government. Looking forward to the future, I mean, again, these techniques are going to be tried again. Once the Kremlin finds something that's effective, they're going to continue to use it. So that's why we're concerned about parliamentary elections. I think that's where the United States and the European allies needs to step up sharing of intelligence with Moldovan authorities so that they can get to this network sooner and confront it and rather than wait for a first round of a, uh, a presidential election to take place before the government had the means and the intelligence and, and the wherewithal to combat it. So that's what we're hoping for. That's what the United States and its partners can do to help Moldova. Thank you. Would I have our other panelists like to join in? All right, Dr. Blank. Uh, if I understand your, cor your question correctly, it's uh, what can we do, right, in the next nine months? Well, as I said, one thing we can do, uh, and, I, and I hope the Biden administration and the incoming Trump administration will lose, is give Ukraine the weapons it needs to win. Winning for Ukraine takes the pressure off Moldova militarily. And that pressure is enormous. And it helps create the foundation for everything else. Second, uh, a victory for Ukraine opens up alternative energy sources for southeastern Europe because Ukraine has the potential to become an energy exporter, not just oil and gas, but green energy as well, provided that is, you have reconstruction of Ukraine, and that's part of the, quote, victory package. Third, organizations like Steve's, the Democratic Party organization that does similar work, and the EU need to work with Moldovans on a permanent basis to educate the population into democratic ways of governance and participation. Fourth, we need to get alternative sources of energy in there now, not just after Ukraine is liberated. And this, I've written about this in earlier articles about you know, building pipelines and interconnectors and green energy capabilities into the Balkans, which need them, and which would facilitate the whole movement of the Balkans in, into the EU, or those, that, those countries that are already in the EU would improve conditions, like, say, Bulgaria. Uh, fifth, the U.S. government finally needs, and I hope the Trump administration will do this, to undertake an information policy that exposes the Russian lies and exposes the information warfare they are doing throughout Europe. And now, sixth, because of what we are now seeing with the attacks on civilian infrastructure, uh, airlines, cyber, uh, elections and so forth that the Russians are undertaking, that you have upgraded intelligence cooperation among all Western states to thwart this Russian offensive. In other words, the response needs to be strategic and it needs to be whole of government. Thank you. Oh, Dr. Jensen. Uh, just to amplify well, one thing which Steve said, which I fully agree with, which is to say the Russian information operations are very extensive, very sensitive to local circumstances, and very sensitive in this case to the fact that there's an election going on. So if you track telegram channels, which is most of you probably know about, you track narratives, they are consistently hitting some themes which the Moldovan government seems, as you said, not fully capable of responding to. When they were counting the votes, there were attacks by Russia on the Central Election Commission, the Moldovan Central Election Commission. Uh, every part of what was, by all accounts, a free and fair election 
was attacked by Russia in a very sophisticated way. But the other part of it is more longstanding. As I said, the Russians have been involved trying to destabilize Moldova for a long time, most recently since Sandu came to power. And there's a set of different narratives, energy, uh, economics, ethnic prejudice, and so forth, which they hit also at the same time. It's a very formidable arsenal of weapons. And I think we don't fully appreciate how much residence it can have when you're a farmer in rural Moldova or in rural Ukraine or whatever it might be. You see the point. And so we don't really have a sophisticated way of pushing back on this kind of stuff. And the Russians are always moving. TV, radio. When I was at RFE, it was shortwave, which the younger people in the audience have probably never heard of. Uh, but the weapons are there, and the Russians are very, very sophisticated in picking out an arsenal that they think might work in a given situation. If you look at Italy, which I look at a lot politically, France, Germany, Moldova, Ukraine, Georgia, they're always the same techniques in a way, but they're employed in different and I would argue very dangerous and sophisticated ways. We need to look at that threat, as I've said several times this afternoon, in a more, I hate that word holistic, but uh, in a more broader way. Thank you, Dr. Jensen. I believe we'll move on to our next question. Mr. Deputy Ambassador, if you could state for the record your name and affiliation. that you understand more, more uh, the complexity of everything that is going on. And Mr. Uh, Mr. Mr. Jensen just pointed out that Russian interference is very complex. Uh, and they play with a, lo a lot of narratives. And the result of the referendum, it's also, it's also based not only on illegal bribery and illegal pooling of money, but also it's its narratives, its influence, and it's a lot of instruments which probably we, we, don't, we don't fully, fully understand uh, them now. So the idea is the following, just as numbers. Only in October and September, 39 million euros were poured in Moldova, just sums that were discovered by the police and the prosecution office. Just as a comparison, United States offers to Moldova per year uh, assistance, budgetary assistance, $50 million. Uh, uh, again, there is a narrative trying to mention or they are trying to separate somehow in what is happening internally or the people living in Moldova and the people from diaspora. They don't like people from diaspora because they cannot influence them the same way they influence those that are in Moldova. So there is uh, why there is this uh, um, uh, try to, to, to do the separation. Uh, one of the speakers was speaking about discontent. I'll give an example related to discontent, and probably if we take from the people what they now have, and I'll speak now about the region of Ungen, which receives the, the most uh, impressive investments and money from EU, and 80% of the people living in Ungen have the Romanian passport. Imagine the following situation, if the Romania would decide to take their, their citizenship, for the 80% of the people, and, uh, United, uh, and the European Union would decide, uh, would decide uh, not to invest in Ungen uh, the money that it has invested till now. Would they be content in that situation? Uh, that would be my question for the Russians, or for the people that, uh, and for Ungen who has voted against the referendum. Excuse me, Mr. Deputy Ambassador, what would be your question for our panelists? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll come to the question. I'm coming to the question. The idea is the following, what I'm saying. The idea is the following. 
So Russia is uh, intervening and is playing against the rules. Romania that has its citizens, EU that is also operating following, following the values and the principle, United States, till it approves some, uh, some assistance that needs to be, uh, to be directed to Moldova, you have to follow all the procedure, appropriation committees, things, Department of State. So you have a, a big cycle on, on doing that. Russia plays differently. Uh, now we are speaking about what happened uh, to the election. Russia now already is thinking how it will uh, uh, prepare or already is preparing for parliamentary and two years in ahead. I would say another thing. We speak now today about European future. Sincerely, my advice would be uh, probably that it would be necessary that uh, the path for what we are doing now in the EU would be better understood. And in this sense, you can help better or by interference and by assistance, you, cre you can create synergies. Uh, the idea is the following. How, that, that's what I'm coming to my question. It was mentioned that US must support us as strategic partners and allies. The format of interaction, the highest format of interaction now between Moldova and US is strategic dialogue. There are countries with which uh, there is a strategic partnership. So the idea would be, and to reflect, and my question would be, or my appeal would be to contribute how uh, we would see our uh, partnership in future, meaning transiting from the only strategic dialogue to something more. And again, speaking about a lie. Uh, it's a nice word, but I know that when you have a certain type of ally that imposes that U.S. can offer you something. So it would be very cool and great that for Moldova we def define what type of ally we are and what can we get at, uh, from this status of ally. We know that there are NATO allies, we know that there are non-NATO allies, and different, different... Uh, so my question would be the following. Uh, how do you see U.S. support, inter not intervention, but support more in this sense, bearing in mind that we are going to this path, and if Russia doesn't manage, so at a certain point we will become a, uh, a member state, or at least prepare to be a member state. Parliamentary elections, that's super fine. It, it, it is a, as a key point. But I'm telling you now what Russia is doing. They are already developing the narratives, and referendum that, that Maya Sandu didn't win, uh, the referendum didn't pass in Moldova, these will be used at each step that we do with the European Union. You'll have to do a reform on cluster, on cluster 5, which relates to ag agriculture, chapter 12 or chapter 13. The Russians will come via their proxies and they will say, look what is being done. So my question again, how do we see the future and how we align our forces in a way that we create syner synergies? Uh, that's a reflection. I don't, don't ask that you give the, question, the, the answers now. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Nix, please. Yeah, let me just pick up on your comment, Anton, about parliamentary elections. So let me go into some more detail about the scheme, the Russian scheme. Uh, I received a briefing from the Minister of Internal Affairs while I was there for the elections. Uh, the scheme consisted of three main components, although there are many more. Uh, number one, uh, Moldovan citizens were flown to various places, Doha, uh, Istanbul, other places in the region, and given cash in the amount of 9,999 euros, which is one euro below the limit that one is allowed to take into Moldova. Secondly, there is a bank that the ministry has, has identified uh, that has made massive transfers of, of funds to Moldovan citizens. In fact, the day after the first round, there were 14,000 trans transactions made from this bank in Moscow to Moldovan citizens. Third, uh, there was another, uh, another scheme where the Shore Network just handed out gift cards. So again, it was cash, it was electronic transfers, and gift cards. 110,000, at a minimum, Moldovan citizens were engaged in an attempt by their vote. This is massive, given the size of Moldova, massive, and dispositive of the outcome of the election, if it's successful. Thankfully, the Moldovan government did take the steps that I referenced earlier to, I think, suppress this effort in the second round. Uh, 
but we have to be prepared for this to happen again. So my suggestion would be that the new administration develop some sort of a task force where the U.S. is sharing intelligence with their Moldovan counterparts so they can confront this earlier in the election cycle than during the actual campaign and, and thwart it. Dr. Jensen, Dr. Blank, do you have any suggestions for the incoming administration as so far as the U.S.-Moldova partnership goes? Well, I've already stated, you know, what I think the incoming administration should do. Uh, in general, uh, the West has to have uh, a, a higher estimation of the importance of the Balkans in its strategy uh, against Russia. But uh, it, what is necessary is that the West develop its plans in tandem with the Moldovan government. And the Moldovan government and the West have to coordinate in these things to identify the source, the corruptors and the institutions involved, to expose Russian inst informational networks, to expose Russian sabotage and, and, and espionage, not only in Moldova, but it, around it as well. And as I said, it has to put the pressure on Moscow in Ukraine because, uh, again, that takes off some of the pressure from Moldova. Would any other panelists like to comment? Just an add to what these two gentlemen said, which is I think we need to look as well, not at, we have to obviously look at the external pressures on Moldova, but the bottom line for me is that we increase Moldova's resilience and great, encourage greater success at integrating some of these problems, the regions into the society, so these issues go away or are minimized to the extent more than they have. I don't want to, I have many Moldovan friends I don't want to criticize, but there's a passivity there, I think, that they're on the back foot a lot, and we saw in the elections. They thankfully caught up, but I think we need to look at this kind of holistic view of the country as a potential European aspirant, as a potential European Union member, and realize that a lot of the, the, the effort of the building this resilience has to come from the country, the leadership of the country, civil society of the country with its Western partners. Three of us, have, I think, very articulately talked about the banks in Moscow and the money that changes hand. That's all true, but we need to address the problem, too, which is, I think, deeper than just Russian influence, although Russian influence is certainly the most dangerous threat for now <coughs> and for the foreseeable future. But again, the issue is building a viable democratic society, and they're on the way, but they're just there's a considerable ways to go as well, and all of us here need to help. All right, thank you. We can move on to our next question. Please state your name <coughs> and affiliation, and let us keep questions to a respectable time so we can continue <laughs> with all of them. Thank you. I'll do my best. Um, hi, uh, my name is Sarah Clough, um, and I see some familiar faces in, uh, in the audience. Um, I, I was Sarah Martin, I'm now Sarah Clough. Um, so, um, I'm the I'm with I'm with Freedom House. I am our program officer in charge of programs in Moldova, um, and so a lot of our conversation today has been around the geopolitical angle of uh, of the country, and I want to try to address and unpack civil society a little bit. Um, so the narrative that or the, the, the reality of, of Russian interference and Russian manipulation is not something I'm going to contest. Um, it's very true, it's very obvious. Um, but there are genuine concerns that come from the Moldovan citizenry. Um, and there are things that the government is doing and that the uh, and that the incumbent president has done uh, that warrants criticism. As civil society, how do you navigate this very complicated and very politicized question of providing uh, feedback and criticism without, um, without falling into the, well, everything against pass and everything against Sandu is just Russian propaganda? Thank you. All right, thank you. We'll begin with Mr. Nix. Sure. Well, 
I'll, uh, I'll rise to the defense of President Sandu in this instance, who has done incredible things since she's been elected to office. Uh, not just in terms of Moldova's accession to the EU, the steps she's taken. Again, she inherited a huge economic mess. She inherited hundreds of thousands of Ukrainian refugees. She inherited a huge uh, energy issue and has tried to deal with all these many multifaceted complex issues uh, constructively and democratically. Uh, it's not easy. Uh, it's easy to criticize someone in that position. Uh, it's uh, more important, I think, to support somebody in that position. Uh, that's certainly what we do at IRI. We try to uh, build political parties, uh, build governance, as I stated earlier, to try to link up uh, the central government more with the, uh, the north and with the south, and that's what we'll continue to do. Um, this is, as Don has described and Steve has described, a very fragile state. So I would, I would, uh, I come out on the side of uh, the government deserves more praise than it does criticism at this point. We need to do everything we can to continue to support this country on its path to Europe and defend it from Russian aggression. Dr. Jensen or Dr. Blank? Dr. Blank, start us off. Yeah, if you read the uh, European Commission report for Moldova, I, you're shaking your head so you're familiar with it, uh, you'll see that they've made it in many areas, progress. So that progress has to be rewarded uh, by, by, both by the European uh, Union and by uh, the United States uh, in order to encourage further progress there. Second, uh, to the extent that you improve governance, you improve governance uh, under the rule of law. And the rule of law protects dissent. So that criticism of the regime is not necessarily subversive in intent, let alone content. And that even if it is subversive in content, it can be protected by law, such as we have here in the United States, or the other democracies have their own version of it. So th that's, that's one concrete example uh, of what you're talking about. But also to the extent that the administration can improve economic conditions, reduce the conditions that allow for ethnic grievance. Criticism will diminish and it will be channeled into legal channel, uh, channels. Uh, and, and you'll be able to see that if you're an observer of what's going on in Moldova as you and you know, your colleagues are. Uh, I will speak anecdotally and impressionistically and without your having been there. Transnistria is a very interesting place, and everybody I know from Moldova has said that the vociferous tendencies have declined in the last couple of years because Transnistria has been linked to the EU and Romania in trade, and the economic grievances, as my friend said, have gone down. So there are places where progress has been made, and you can almost see it. You can certainly feel it. So it's not a hopeless effort in any case, but as I guess we're all saying that the average Moldovan has to feel a stake in the Western journey. And I'm, as we saw two weeks ago, not enough to. Dr. Jensen, thank you. We can proceed to our next question. Please state your name and affiliation. Good afternoon. I'm Carl Hickey Yorks. I'm from the Joint Baltic American National Committee. I recall Mr. Stephen recommending that uh, the Moldovan government should go to the minority communities and speak to them in Russian and try and uh, engage with them and learn their issues. But I see an issue with trying to communicate with them in Russian, as what was previously pointed out is that when you speak Russian, Russia will view you as a R Russian or a Russian citizen. Mm -hmm. and it does not help the situation if we are integrating ourselves into their sphere. So how would you recommend instead communicating with them and integrating them into n normal Madorovan society without increasing the issues that Russia can use? Thank you. Beginning with Mr. Nix. Well, first of all, as a Russian speaker, I will politely decline 
Vladimir Putin's offer to uh, offer me protection. Uh, don't need it. Uh, neither does my wife, uh, who's Ukrainian. Uh, with regard to this issue, I mean, let's face the facts, is that people in Gagu speak Russian. Um, they no longer really have direct access to Russian TV, but they watch Russian TV on the internet. So this is a gradual thing. Uh, eventually, just like in Ukraine, as Ukraine is, is moving away from Russian language towards Ukrainian, our polling data uh, tells us that. Uh, this will happen in Moldova too, but it will be gradual. And what I'm talking about is dealing with the political crisis that could erupt in 2025 if the current government doesn't secure more votes in the North and the South, in the Russian-speaking areas. So there has to be an effort short-term to listen to those people, listen to their grievances, move towards them. As I said earlier, increase the connectivity. In the long term, you know, I believe as Moldova continues to move towards the EU, that the language uh, issue will become a minor issue. But it will take time. It will take time. Dr. Blank or Dr. Jensen? Uh, just to follow up what you said, Steve, there are many countries in the region which are multilingual. Uh, and as your polling data shows in Ukraine, uh, the more people are speaking Ukraine not because Russian speaking is somehow suppressed. It's just they speak Ukrainian for other geopolitical reasons. That makes all sorts of sense. So it's a problem not reaching these people, whatever language they speak. And it's the reaching of the people in whatever way that you can that makes a difference. RFE, for example, has programmatic outreach to Russian-speaking areas in Ukraine. And that's what you strive for, connecting, not necessarily force them to change the language because they're going to pick that up or they're going to speak what they want anyway based on a calculation of costs and benefits. Uh, as, as Donna said, you need to reach voters in their language and speak to their concerns. Now, everybody in this room has probably seen at least one of the postmortems of last Tuesday's elections, which complains that the Democratic Party lost because it did not address voters' concerns about the economy or about other issues. And the media here is full of that. And everybody in America speaks English for the, or understands English. So it's, they, they all spoke the same language. But they didn't really speak the same language in the sense that they didn't address themselves to what's on people's minds. In Moldova, where you have an ethnic and linguistic problem, if you cannot address people in their language and address yourself to their most pressing concerns, you have left the field open to Moscow. It may be different in the Baltic states, where you do have another case of substantial Russian diasporas, but who are nonetheless being integrated into Baltic society uh, more and more over the past 33 years. In Moldova, the election results show that there are substantial vulnerabilities at home. If not for the diaspora, Sandu would have lost and the European Union referendum would have lost. That means that the Moldovan government has a lot of work to do to reach citizens. And that means you have to address yourself to them in a language that they understand and to the concerns that motivate them. We have time for a couple more questions. So if you please state your name and affiliation. Hi, my name is Anna Harvey and I'm a recent graduate from the Stanford Center for Russian, East European and Eurasian Studies and one of Ms. Baker's Moldova Fulbright colleagues. Um, and this last summer I was in Estonia as a research assistant and in both Moldova and Estonia, something that I saw was within the Russian-speaking communities, um, many people felt like they did not have satisfactory alternatives to Russian state media when it came to um, language of choice media. And so I guess this is a good follow-up to the previous question of how do we reach those people who maybe don't have access to other media, even if it exists, they don't necessarily choose to go to Radio Free Europe, for example, or Medusa for their media. What can the US government do? What can the Moldovan government do to 
combat this disinformation that we see within the Russian state media space and provide alternatives for those people who are not moving away from Russian language sources. Thank you. Thank you. This may be our last question as I want to give our panelists time to give their final remarks. Would Eddie like to address this? Just real quickly, I mean, it's important to note that the Mold Moldovan government is empowered to regulate television, but it doesn't have regulatory powers over the internet. And Russia has taken full advantage of that fact. Uh, the Moldovan government has curtailed Russian TV broadcasts, uh, but Moldovan citizens can still access uh, Russian news, uh, Russian disinformation via the internet. So again, one, one of the ideas that I think Parliament will debate uh, this year or early next year will be uh, developing a regulatory scheme that would address this problem on the internet. Dr. Blank? Yes. Uh, as I mentioned, you have to address people in the language that they understand. There's no alternative here. And uh, the U.S. in its information policies, as Don said, has instruments at its disposal to do that. Uh, uh, Deutsche Welle and BBC and, and Radio France, uh, Radio 24 France probably have similar uh, instruments at their disposal because uh, they are able to uh, broadcast worldwide. So they obviously can broadcast in Russian. It is also necessary for the Moldovan government to train, as part of its disinformation policies, people who speak and read Russian fluently and who can go into these communities and expose the lie, but also address themselves to whatever is on its citizens' minds. And that's in keeping with its democratic mandate. When the, if the, you know, I'll give you an example from here, yesterday. Uh, Representative Ocasio-Cortez sends out this message to people who voted for her and Trump. How come? And she got these answers uh, because, I mean, these are the last two people you'd expect to be juxtaposed in an election, yet, you know, several hundred or thousand people did it. The same thing is true with the Moldovan government. They, you can send out inquiries to your Russian-speaking population. What is your uh, grievance against the government? Let, you know, let's try to have a conversation and address it. There are ways to deal with Russian information policies, threats, but you have to carry out that confrontation with the Russians head on, and it needs to be done both by Moldova, but by its patrons in Europe and in the United States, and it has to be done in the language of the audience, not in the language of the institutions. Do we have one question for the Helsinki Commission? Uh, we do not. Okay. In that case, we will use our remaining time to give our panelists time to give final remarks, to address any subjects which we didn't have time for earlier, and to give any final thoughts or recommendations from the Moldovan government on their path to EU accession. So we'll begin in opposite order with Dr. Blank and move our way back. Well, I, I've already given an extensive list of recommendations, so I'm not going to repeat it. And I mean, they're all in the, the transcript and in, in my testimony. But I would urge all of you to report back to your offices this, the absolute necessity for the incoming administration to treat Moldova and for that matter the Balkans in a strategic sense, not to see these as isolated or the countries that are somehow detached from the problem of the Russian war in Ukraine. That is misleading in the highest degree and it is a barrier to effective policy making let alone to a sound U.S. strategy. A sound U.S. strategy for Moldova, as well, I would argue, for the Balkans in general, is that Russia must be defeated in Ukraine. This opens up a lot of possibilities for the Balkans in terms of not only of dealing with ethnic and, uh, grievances, but also reducing Russian military pressure on the Balkans and Russian energy leverage and thus information leverage that is a derivation in many cases from Russia's uh, ability to gain huge revenues in energy and so forth. And in those, that way, not only Moldova, but its neighboring Balkan governments can then better address themselves to their domestic problems and create what we might call a virtuous circle as they strive either to join the EU or to improve their ability to carry out their membership requirements there. Thank you. Dr. Jensen, finishing remarks? Yes. I. Uh... You said if, if Russia loses, if Russia wins in Ukraine, uh, 
if Russia wins or loses, this is just my personal opinion, Russia will still be Russia. And that means Moldova and Georgia and Ukraine and Estonia have to worry about their big neighbor to the east. And that means the questions of resilience, of enlightened leadership, of reaching out to disaffected communities is very critical, not only for Moldova's national security, but for everybody's. And again, as Steve said, this is one big problem, which is the future of Russia and the regime. And I don't think it's going to finish anytime soon or get very mild anytime soon. So the time, the time for now, whether it's in Moldova or Georgia or elsewhere, for addressing and to show our support to help them and, and uh, stop what's a very, very alarming trend in Russian foreign policy. Thank you. Mr. Nix, final thoughts? Sure. I, I've made my recommendations with regard to what the USG and, and our European allies can do in Moldova. I'd like to address the connectivity of uh, Moldova and Ukraine that, that Steve brought up and then, then Don followed up on. Uh, a lot of people in this room, Paul and others, know very well that in addition to the taking of Donbass and the conquest of Kiev, the third objective of Russia's war plan was an amphibious assault on Odessa after which Russia would then go north, would take Chisinau. I've made that drive, it's a three hour drive, five hours by armored vehicle. Take Chisinau, link up with the Russian 14th Army, and then go east and link up with forces in Donbass, therefore encompassing what Steve referred earlier to is what Putin calls Novaya Russia. That was the original goal. Thankfully, the Ukrainians took out the warship Moskva and the Black Sea, and this is, this is information I got from the Ukrainian side, not the US side, but that ship had one of the most sophisticated air defense systems of any ship in the Russian fleet. And if the Ukrainians could take out that ship, the Russians calculated, think what they could do to a troop ship or a supply ship during an amphibious landing. So therefore, Russia backed off its plan to attack Odessa, thus saving Moldova. So back to Steve's point is, the USG and Europe have to do everything that they can to assist Ukraine in winning this war because it affects not just Moldova, it affects Belarus, it affects Russia itself. So again, emphasis on assisting Ukraine as it relates to Moldova. Thank you. Thank you. This is a very good note to end on as what happens in Moldova does have consequences much greater than the borders of its own country. Thank you so much, all of you, for coming today. And it's been a pleasure having you here to discuss Moldova's European future. Thank you so much for your expert remarks. This meeting is closed. Thank you. Thank you.